Amen. Our primary scripture for today is 1 Samuel, starting in chapter 8, and we begin at verse 4. Fed up, all the elders of Israel got together and confronted Samuel at Ramah. They presented their case. Look, you're an old man, and your sons aren't following in your footsteps. <clears throat> Here's what we want you to do. Appoint a king to rule us just like everybody else. When Samuel heard their demand, give us a king to rule us, he was crushed. How awful Samuel prayed to God. God answered Samuel, go ahead and do what they're asking. They're not rejecting you. They've rejected me as their king. From the day I brought them out of Egypt until this very day, they've been behaving like this, leaving me for other gods, and now they're doing it to you. So let them have their own way, but warn them of what they're in for. Tell them the ways of king, the way kings operate, just what they're likely to get from a king. So Samuel told them, delivered God's warning to the people who are asking him to give them a king. He said, this is the way the kind of king you're talking about operates. He'll take your sons and make soldiers of them. Chariotry, cavalry, infantry, regimented in battalions and squadrons. He'll put some to forced labor on his farms, plowing and harvesting, others to, <clears throat> others to making either weapons of war or chariots in which he can ride in luxury. He'll put your daughters to work as beauticians and waitresses and cooks. He'll conscript your best fields, vineyards, and orchards, and hand them over to his special friends. He'll tax your harvests and vintage to support his extensive bureaucracy. Your prize workers and best animals he'll take for his own use. He'll lay a tax on your flocks, and you'll end up no better than slaves. The day will come when you will cry in desperation because of this king you so much want for yourselves, but don't expect God to answer. But the people wouldn't listen to Samuel. No, they said, we will have a king to rule us. Then we'll be just like all the other nations. Our king will rule us and lead us and fight our battles. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Now, folks, today's supposed to be a baptism, and this is not really a baptism type of scripture. I mean, we talk about losing our sons to kings, and they become this and slaves and that, and this just doesn't seem right. Well, folks... God gives us some unique scriptures to wrestle with sometimes. We're meant to wrestle with faith and our understanding of who God is. The thing is, this works out well because, one, just like I talked to the kids about, we do at times want to blend in, don't we? We hide who we are so that somebody doesn't realize that we're different. And we even will surround ourselves with other people who are like us so that we can blend in even more. Okay, And that doesn't always work out in the long run, does it? We segregate people so that we can all be just like ourselves, and ultimately what do we do? We create an us-them situation, which raises situations to a point where there can be what? Conflict. Because when we separate ourselves from others into segregated type of groups by saying, well, you're like them, so you stay over there, and I'm like these folks, so you stay, we'll stay over here. Eventually, we need to have more space, don't we? And so we end up fighting and arguing over what is and isn't supposed to be. Or we reach a point where we want to be like everyone else around us because, well, we don't want to be made fun of for being different. Nobody likes to be made fun of, do they? It's one thing to have a prank played on us that is, you know, minuscule and only lasts for just a moment. It's quite another to be so unique that 
people look at us so differently that we're afraid of being made fun of. The people of Israel have been led by God since they left Egypt. They didn't have a king. They had judges and prophets and prophetesses who were telling them how to behave and what to do. But they didn't want to be like that anymore. They wanted to have all the same trappings as everybody else. Now, when I was in school growing up, 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th grade, you know, when you get into that age bracket, everyone tries to be like everybody else. And so you had to have Jordans for your sneakers with two or three different color shoelaces on it, one of which really needed to be neon in color. Mine was neon green. And as things got dark and dirty, you would color them to try and keep them bright. Because if they weren't, you, you had a situation where somebody would make fun of you. You had to have the right kind of jeans. You had to write, wear the right kind of shirt. I mean, there was a short period of time in ninth grade where guys wore pink striped shirts. And I told my mom I needed to be like everybody else because, you know, I was already made fun of in school because I was short, I was small, I was a lot younger than my classmates, and so there was already a lot of things. So I wanted to fit in. You know how long that trend lasted? Two weeks. Two weeks. And then I had this shirt that my mother forced me to wear because she had to buy it. And we grew up in a family where you didn't waste anything. There was very little extra money. So here we go. I got what I wanted to fit in, and ultimately, did it help me? Every time I wore that shirt to school after that two weeks was over, guess what? I got made. Uh-huh. Israel is going to find that this isn't going to work for them, though they will always look to go back to it because their golden age was while having a king, but their worst age was while having a king. We, as followers of Jesus Christ, have a king and a prophet and a leader, but there are often times where we want to blend in with the rest of the world. We don't want to live like Jesus lived. Why? Because that's not how the world functions. The world is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's every man and woman for themselves. You step on them to get what you want. Whereas Jesus was counter to all of that. Let's think about this for a moment. Culture tells us that we want to continue to move up in society. So we want to hobnob with those who are just a little bit above us until we reach that stage so that we can go to the next stage, right? Yet Jesus, who did he have dinner with? What's that? Tax collectors. Tax collectors. Prostitutes. Sinners, slaves. Jesus spent his time with the people that everyone made fun of and disregarded and wanted nothing to do with. He reached out and touched lepers, the blind, the crippled. Those were all folks who were unclean and you weren't supposed to have anything to do with them. He touched the dead and brought them back to, death, back to life. Yet society... The world tells us these are the people that we should what? Stay away. And the unfortunate reality is, as followers of Jesus, we constructed churches. Folks, remember, the church is a human construction. Jesus was looking for persons who would follow a teaching. And we created the church as a way of institutionalizing this, but also to put boundaries on everybody. I'm not saying the church is bad, I'm just saying we constructed the church. Jesus constructed followers. And as we moved our church forward, the church started among the poorest and the least wanted, and eventually became part of the upper echelons, and those who were the least and the less likely were kind of left in the dust. We forgot about them. Now we're in an age where we're going, oh, wait a minute, we need to take care of the least and the lost. And you know, experience has taught me 
The folks who already know Jesus the best have been the ones who've had the least. Because they've already learned that in order to survive, they have to share what they've got with those who have what they need. And they have what those folks need. And so they've learned to share in order to survive. The most vibrant churches that I have ever walked through. And this is not a slam against Hope United Methodist Church or Faxon or Bethel or Ramey or Janesville or Smoke Run or any other church I've served. But the most vibrant churches I've ever been a part of were in slums. The most healthy, active following of Jesus, desiring to devour the word of God, to love one another and support one another and encourage one another and make sure that we all made it through, those churches that did that were the ones that I found in slums. What does that have to do with this, Pastor? My fear is too many churches, especially in the western part of the world, Europe and the United States, Canada and otherwise, have wanted to blend in with society. And we have forgotten who we were called to. Jesus said that he came to the least, the lost, and he demonstrated it by staying and spending his time with those who were not desired by everybody else. The church needs to reclaim that truth. We have called for a king. And so we set up pastors and councils and bishops and conferences and denominations and we set up all these structures to try and make us look like businesses kingdoms how's it worked for us did we get what we wanted yeah we looked just like everybody else we've lost our unique so I'm calling us, God is calling us, Jesus is calling us back to something else. Love God, love your neighbor. And the definition of neighbor is anybody you meet. Every person you drive by that cuts you off. You're not meant to curse them. You should be blessing them, right? Every person who Karens, as the new term seems to be, I don't like it, but that seems to be the new term. You in a grocery store or wherever else, we are to offer them a blessing. We're not meant to curse them. When somebody does us wrong, you did done me wrong. We should be offering a Blessing instead of a curse. And when we see someone who is in desperate need, or even minor need, we, if we have the resource to help, need to do so. Our kingdom is not of this world. Our king is Jesus. Our ruler is Jesus. And his example was to wash the feet of his disciples. His example was to accept the blame that belonged to someone else. His example was to make enough food to feed 5,000 out of almost nothing. And again, 4,000 out of almost nothing. His example was to raise the dead. His example was to provide for a wedding. His example was to heal the leper and the dead and the blind and to eat with sinners. Amen.